So welcome everyone to this session, Closure Through the Lens of Music by Dave Yarwood. So uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, we are so glad that you were able to join us. Over to you, Dave. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. It's actually morning here. Um, it's about nine o'clock in the morning, 9.30 in the morning uh, here in Durham, North Carolina on the east coast of the US. And I've just had my breakfast and I'm ready to go. So, so I'm going to talk about the Closure Standard Library and how we can understand what the functions in the library are doing by visualizing them through music. But before we get into that, a little bit about me. I'm a software engineer at Kevl. But before that, my educational background is in music composition. And in the mid 2000s, I picked up a strange hobby, which is text-based music composition. And I, I did not invent this concept. There are, there are actually a lot of languages out there for audio programming or music composition programming. But at the time, I couldn't find anything that really got at uh, my goals, which were to generate or to create classical music uh, by writing code and to have the full power of Western standard musical notation at my disposal. So I ended up creating my own language called Alda. And that's been my passion project for the last 10 years. So a little bit more about Alda. As I've said, Alda is a text-based music composition programming language. The idea is text in, music out. And I've designed the syntax to be as easy as possible for people with little to no programming experience to learn, partially because at the time, I myself had very little programming experience. So the, the language is a markup. It's what you see is what you get. So this is uh, very easy for new people to, to, to pick up, even if they don't know about kind of higher order concepts like functions or classes or anything like that. So uh, especially if you have a little bit of a music background, uh, learning this is, is very similar to, uh, it should map very cleanly to your understanding of concepts of music like notes and chords. But as programmers, we have additional superpowers. And markup languages are very easy to generate uh, from, from programming languages, like a more Turing complete programming language. Uh, so I've been having a lot of fun exploring that. So in this talk, I'll be showing you examples of uh, ways that I've created music by generating this markup language from a programming language, in this case, Clojure. So the library that I've created for this is called Alda CLJ. And under the hood, what this is doing is it's putting together a string of valid Alda markup code, like we saw in the previous slide. But now instead of working at the markup level, we're working a level higher where we're generating the markup. So now this is great because we can create our own abstractions on top of the base uh, ideas like music, uh, like, uh, like notes and chords. So um, we're going to see some examples of that. Uh, I also want to talk about a couple of big ideas uh, while, I'm give, while I'm giving this uh, demonstration. One of them is an idea that as functional programmers, I think we all understand uh, inherently, but you may not have heard it expressed in these terms. So I'm going to borrow some terms from Eric Norman, who is a well-known figure in the closure community. And he just recently wrote this excellent book called Grokking Simplicity. And in this book, he talks about uh, ways that functional programmers approach uh, writing new code and maintaining existing code by applying what he calls functional thinking. So this is a lot like functional programming, but it's kind of coming from more of an angle of uh, practical skills that you would use in the workforce uh, and less of an academic angle. So even I think if, even if you have a lot of background in functional programming, this is a great book to read because it might uh, put to words some of the ideas that you've had in the back of your head for a long time. So in, in his book, Eric talks about, one of the first things he talks about is this uh, trichotomy of data, calculations, and actions. And he describes this as skill number one that functional programmers must have in order to uh, do what they need to do. So a functional programmer is always good at distinguishing between data, calculations, and actions. Every definition in your code will either be data or a calculation or an action. So data is just static data. It has no behavior. Uh, it must be interpreted by some calculation in order for it to have any kind of meaning, but it's really just data. 
for example, in JavaScript, the data, uh, examples of data would be a JSON object or an array. And then um, functions, every function is either a calculation or an action. And a calculation is what we think of as a pure function. So this is a function that has no side effects. It's not printing something. It's not making an HTTP request. It's not launching any missiles. It is really just taking data as input and producing data as output. And that is all that it's doing. An important property of calculations is that uh, you, you can call them any number of times with the same input and receive the same output. So a random number generating function would not be a calculation. That would be an action because it matters when you call it, you'll get a different result uh, each time. Another important property is that the sequencing of the, the calculations uh, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter uh, what order you call them in because every time you call them, you always get the same output from the same input. Uh, by contrast, an action uh, is typically very, uh, it, it matters a lot when you call it and what order you call different actions in because they all tend to rely on global state. And um, you know, let's, for, for a metaphorical example here, let's, let's say we're writing some functions that represent making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So uh, you might have some functions that represent actions like slicing the bread and spreading the peanut butter. But if you're not careful to call the actions in the correct order, you'll end up with a mess. So uh, kind of the lesson to be learned here is that as functional programmers, it's really best if we try to stick with data and calculations as much as possible. But of course, actions are inevitable. We always need to do some kind of action. We need to make a database query or put an item in a queue. So um, you know, actions are important as well, but we can help keep our code manageable by deferring taking the action until we absolutely need to. So why am I mentioning this? Well, uh, I've been finding myself, even before I read this book, I think I was following this pattern uh, as I've been writing code in Alda or Alda CLJ to create programmatic music. It's always a similar pattern to this where uh, we start with some kind of data. Uh, an example of some data that I've actually used in a musical composition is weather forecast data that I pulled from the Nather National Weather Service API. So it might be a list of high and low temperatures. It's just data. And then uh, the calculation is some kind of algorithm that I come up with that produces uh, some kind of data that represents music in what I think is an interesting way. Now, this is just a calculation. We're not, uh, we're not actually playing the music data. There's no side effects here. We're just taking this input data and producing uh, an output data, which is uh, it represents music. We'll see some examples of this in, um, later in the talk. And then the action is just uh, taking that data and performing it. The other big idea that I want to talk about here is the power of visualization. This is a screenshot of this great tutorial for the Racket programming language, which I encourage you all to check out. Uh, this is great because they're using a graphical environment uh, called Dr. Racket. It's a sort of like an IDE for Racket. And uh, the way that they're, uh, this is a tutorial to the Racket language. And so the way that they're presenting the concepts is by using this library of graphics so that uh, you can actually see, um, you know, a representation of what the, what each function is doing. So for example, here, we can see that that series is a function that takes, you know, some kind of uh, shape producing function, and it produces three shapes of three different sizes. Now we could also understand that by reading through the code and, and trying to understand what HC append is and, and what all this is doing. But at a glance, our brains are very good at understanding uh, what this is. And uh, we're very good at abstracting, especially in a visual way like this. So the experiment here in this, in this demo is to visualize things, not visually, but with, uh, with audio and with music. So I'm going to jump into my editor here. And hopefully the audio is, uh, is going to come through here. If it isn't, uh, please interrupt me. Uh, but so we're going to use the Alda CLJ library here. And uh, I have both an Alda REPL and a Clojure REPL running. So I can connect the Clojure REPL to the Alda REPL and start a new score. 
And here we have just the markup syntax that I talked about at the very beginning of the talk. Um, so we can play this. We can just hand it a string of Alda code, and it will just hand that over to Alda. Um, so this is this is useful, but uh, as programmers, we really want to work with data and calculations. So Alda CLJ gives you this library of uh, functions that represent musical events. And when you evaluate them, this is just a calculation. Like we take a string and we end up with a record that represents uh, an event that says to play uh, play the following notes on a piano. So this is just a closure map with a, a indication that this is supposed to be a piano. And then we can see that these uh, note uh, calls evaluate to records as well. So these are closure maps that describe a note. So it has a pitch, how high or low the note is, and a duration, how long the note is to be played. And if we play this, it produces the same result. And it even returns the string of all the code that it generated. Uh, but I'm aware that not all of you are musicians, so uh, this, I'm aware that some of this might confuse you with, um, we're talking about half notes and eighth notes and dotted quarter notes and sharps and flats. So uh, actually to facilitate um, the programmatic uh, music that we're about to create, we're not going to work with Western music notation. Instead, we're going to work with just numbers. So here's another example of something you can do with Alda CLJ. Instead of specifying that a note is a C sharp or an E flat or something like that, you can give it a MIDI note number. So the, the general MIDI spec has a range, a very wide range of notes from zero through 128. And we can just give it a number. And uh, so what we we'll hear here is um, that each note will be one semitone higher than the previous. And we can also express durations, not in musical terms like half notes, but in milliseconds. So here we have 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, and we'll hear the, that the duration of each note is double of that that uh, was played before it. So this is all set up to kind of show um, what we can do with programmatic composition. And what we just played, we heard the notes uh, we, we saw the notes um, explicitly written out here. We have a note that's forty the forty uh, the note forty two for one hundred milliseconds and the note forty three at two hundred milliseconds. Uh, but we have a clear pattern here. We have a range of notes from forty two through forty seven, and we have a pattern where we start with one hundred and then we double it every time. So in closure, we can use the iterate function to uh, to multiply a number by two and and keep producing that uh, you know keep multiplying by two to get the next item in the sequence. So that's an infinite sequence, a lazy sequence, and we can make it finite by just using, by using the take function to, to just take six of those, uh, those numbers. So we can see this result here. So I've, I've annotated this as one source of data, and then another source, another data uh, source is the range of numbers from 42 through 48. And then uh, we have another calculation here, which is that we're mapping this this uh, this function. Um, so this is this is the calculation. We're taking our numbers, for example, the number forty two and the number one hundred, and the calculation is that we return a note that has that MIDI note and that number of milliseconds. Uh, so we can kind of see this if we want to, uh, without playing it. We can just do this calculation and and see the result. So we have a list of six notes, six actually six records that represent notes. And they have the, the note numbers and the durations that we've just uh, talked about. And then if we play it, we can hear that this is the same as the example above. All right, so now we've kind of uh, established the basics of what I'm uh, showing here. So we can start to explore some of the functions in the standard library. Here's an easy one, you know, there's map. So map takes a function and a list of values, and it produces another list of values that is the result of applying the function to each item in the original list. So we can use this to uh, define a helper function called chromatic scale. So what this does is it returns a list of notes 
um, where they're just incrementing by one every time. So if you were to play this on a piano, you would play every single key on the piano one at a time going up. So we can hear what this sounds like on a harp. So now we can play around with this a little bit more and bring in some more functions. This is just a helper function um, that I've defined to grab the note number given one of these note records. So this is the note record. And we can use this function to pull out just the note number part of it. So this is useful because we can use this in a, a predicate with filter. So as uh, I'm sure you're all aware, filter is a function that uh, takes a function uh, which is a predicate and a list of values, and it will return a list of values that match the predicate. So we're going to keep only the notes in this chromatic scale that are even numbered. So instead of every note in the chromatic scale, we'll have just every other note. And we can see if we count these in our original chromatic scale, we had 78 notes, and now we have half of that, 39 notes. So here again is, so that we can hear the difference, here's what we just played, the full chromatic scale. And then here is only the even numbered notes. Now, if you've watched TV or movies, I'm sure you've heard this sound before. Uh, this is what we call a whole tone scale where you're moving up by two semitones every time. And this has a very, it has kind of a dreamlike quality to it, which is why they often use this in like dream sequences in film and TV. So uh, just to play around with this a little bit more, uh, this, this expression is equivalent to the previous one. We've only changed the predicate function. And now instead of saying if the note is even, we're saying if the note number modulo two equals zero. In other words, does the note evenly divide by two? It sounds the same. But now we can adjust the number and hear what other inter intervals sound like. So we can hear uh, what it sounds like if you space apart the notes by three instead of two. This is what we musicians call a diminished uh, quality. And if we change it to four, this is an augmented quality. So it's interesting to hear how these all have different kind of emotional characteristics. Let's hear a few more. Here's five. And seven. And then here's 12, which is octaves. Let's learn about some more functions. Um, these are a couple of my favorite ones. Here's rand nth. It takes a list of things and it returns, it randomly selects one of the things in the list. So if we call this a few times, we can see that we get four and five and one, five. So it's randomly choosing each time. And repeatedly is a great function that takes a number of times and a function, and it calls that function that number of times. So we can, uh, and we collect the results into a sequence or, or a list. So we can uh, collect three random numbers from a list using repeatedly and rand nth. So uh, let's, uh, let's grab three random numbers from this uh, chromatic range. That's uh, the chromatic range on the harp. So we'll get numbers like 33, 82, 73. So this is, a, I think this is an interesting way to come up with musical ideas. Um, I, I've, I've, I've done this myself in the past by generating random numbers and just seeing how it sounds and then finding things that sound good. And then I'll keep those numbers and I'll um, write out a more deliberate composition uh, using those notes. Uh, here's another great function, it's cycle. So this takes uh, a list of things and it produces an infinite lazy sequence where you repeat those items over and over again. So for example, if you cycle one, two, three, you get the infinite list, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, et cetera. So then we can take that infinite lazy sequence and make it finite by taking just the first 48 items, the first 48 note numbers. Why 48? 
well, it's it's a multiple of four. Four works well in music. Um, I think it's all, it might also be a multiple of three, which may have been why I chose that, because there are three notes. Um, so this will sound uh, even rhythmically. And then we just take those numbers and map this function that turns each number into a note. That one sounds pretty good. So the cool thing is, if I evaluate this again, all the CLJ will just append the new notes onto the end, and we'll hear them as soon as it's done playing with what it's playing. I just really enjoy this. I feel like I could do this all day and just listen for interesting musical ideas. So this is great, right? We're, we're generating music by using functional programming techniques. Here's another example, another function from the Closure Standard Library. This is interpose. And this one, you can see pretty easily what it does by just, if I just evaluate this. Um, so we, you know, if we use interpose x with this list of uh, letters, we get a, x, b, x, c, x. So it's inserting the item in between every item in the list. So we can also easily hear what this does by interposing a high note between a bunch of low notes. All right, here's another one. Um, and don't look too closely at this code. Uh, it might not be the most optimized code for generating prime factors, but uh, I just wanted to play around with a uh, prime factor function. So if we, if we map this prime factor function over the range of uh, numbers from 0 through 10, we, we will get the prime factors of every number. So um, 0 and 1 don't have factors, prime factors. Not sure how mathematically correct that is, but that's what I came up with. Um, and then prime numbers, the only factor is the number itself. So 2, 3, 5, 7, those are prime numbers. And then the other ones, like for example, 8 is 2 times 2 times 2. So this is just to show that mapcat there's a function called mapcat in the closure standard library. And it's just like map, except uh, you use it when you have a function like this that produces a list of lists, or it produces a list so that when you map it over a list, you get a list of lists. Uh, but you might not want a list of lists. You might want a single uh, list. So you can concatenate them all together by using mapcat instead of map. So this is, this is also useful for the kind of ex uh, exploration that we're doing here because we can use mapcat to, um, for each number in the list. So here's our data part. It's just the range of numbers between 40 and 60. We can map a function over this list that returns a list of notes for each of those numbers. And then we'll, we'll concatenate them together because we use mapcat. So this uh, algorithm is a little bit trickier to explain. It's a little bit more complex. Um, but what we're doing is for each number in this list, we are generating uh, one or more notes. And the more notes there are, the, the faster they'll be so that we can all fit them into the same 500 millisecond span of time. So 500 milliseconds for each of those numbers uh, to show the prime factors of each number. And we're also um, adding each prime factor to the note itself. So that might be confusing to hear verbally, uh, but we can, um, for one thing, we can look at this just look at the data that, that this generates. And um, just for example, the first four notes will represent the prime factors for the number 40. And so then those are two and two and two and five. So we're adding each of those to the number 40 because that's the number that we're getting the prime factors of. And the duration of the notes will be 500 divided by four, the number of notes. And then the next number is 41, which is a prime number. So that will take up the entire 500 milliseconds because that's the only factor. And the note number is 41 plus 41. So there's a pattern here that will allow us to easily pick out the prime numbers because they tend to have high note numbers. So um, what I'd like to demonstrate here is that as you listen to this, try to listen for the prime numbers. They'll be, they'll, they will be the notes that are higher in pitch. Did you hear the prime numbers? 
Uh, so I think this is great because um, even if we, you know, if we, if you were to look at this list as data, um, you could find all the prime numbers by looking through and scanning for numbers that look higher than the rest. But your ear is very quick at picking up the high notes, the high frequencies, as compared to the low frequencies. All right. Now I want to um, give a shout out to Aditya. He uh, he he asked me to think about uh, generating music from FizzBuzz. And uh, I got really inspired by that, so I came up with this. So uh, we're going to represent FizzBuzz, just as a quick uh, introduction to FizzBuzz. Uh, this is a, a elementary programming problem, uh, often used to test your skill in programming um, in any language. And the idea is, if the number is divisible by three, it's fizz. So three is fizz. If it's divisible by five, it's buzz. If it's divisible by neither, you just get the number itself. So one and two are not divisible by three or five. And of course, when you get to 15, that's divisible by both three and five. So you get fizz buzz. So we can actually hear the fizz buzz cycle uh, here. So what I've done is I've defined some functions here without looking too deeply at the code. Um, from a high level, what this is doing is it's taking uh, the divisor, so three or five for fizz or buzz, and a note number. And it's producing a sequence where every n notes, so maybe every three notes, we play a note. So we'll, the, the oboe will represent the fizz, and the buzz will be the clarinet. So every five notes, we'll play this other note. And um, I've also added some percussion to uh, make this, um, uh, so, so we can hear more the kind of the rhythm of fizz buzz. Uh, I'm going to comment these out for now so we can hear just the pattern. So what this is, this is periodic notes inverse. Uh, this is like, given these factors, uh, play a note whenever it's not divisible by any of those uh, numbers. So this represents like the, the, the numbers that are neither divisible by three or five. So if we hear this, we can hear uh, a hi-hat playing the notes that are not divisible by, the numbers that are not divisible by three or five and the oboe is the fizz, and the clarinet is the buzz. Now, the interesting, of, the interesting thing about this is that this is actually, it kind of has a natural rhythm to it, and that's because it's cyclical, right? Mathematically, once you get to 15 and you go to 16, you've you've actually started over at one essentially with as far as um, whether the notes are divisible by three or five. And so we actually get this repeating pattern and we can hear this better. We can hear how it repeats uh, if I bring in these other voices in the, in the drums. So we have a kick drum and a triangle. So these will just kind of show you um, what, the, what the pulse is so that you can better hear the rhythms of uh, what the other instruments are doing. So there you go, fizz buzz as music. Now, the last thing I want to show you uh, before I go is um, an experiment that I did recently, um, which is applying similar concepts. Um, I wanted to take words from the dictionary or just any word, any arbitrary word that you provide and, uh, and interpret it as music. And so uh, I was grabbing random words from this dictionary file on my, uh, on my hard drive. Uh, for some reason, a lot of these words have apostrophe S on the end. I don't quite understand why there are so many of those, but I filtered those out just to keep things a little bit more uh, sane, more interesting maybe. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of glossing over what all these functions are doing exactly, I came up with um, a way of interpreting a, a string as a list of note numbers. So we can see this, uh, if I map this function over the word hello, we get, Six, uh, 76, 79, 72, 72, 69. So these are all numbers that represent uh, each character in the string. So um, we can take you know, the string functional conf, for example, and hear what that sounds like. If we interpret those letters as notes, and uh, the space, by the way, represents a pause. So you'll hear that pause in between. Uh, and we're going to play the functional conf on a random instrument. 
know, that's not a very good one. You can't really hear the pitch. And I'm going to stop that. Let's try that again. This is like live coding in action. Oh boy. Hold on. Sorry. I'm going to restart this. Okay. Uh, let's grab another random instrument that hopefully has pitch this time. that's kind of a nice rhythm don't you so let's uh let's try this again but this time the words are going to be randomly chosen from that dictionary file that i showed earlier so for example we might have uh prin principe presumes plaque oh that has a bunch of p words or we could get rover exteriors biggles i guess we have some uh proper names in there as well um and so each each of these words is going to be played by a different instrument all at the same time and why this is interesting is that you can hear uh, kind of the, the rhythmic way that these words play off of each other. The words are lefts, transmissible, and moisturized. The longer words kind of linger at the end because they, it takes longer for them to finish. All right, and uh, let's actually let's look. Let's listen to another one. I think we have time. Ooh. This is kind of a crazier one. This is we have despoiled daggers and axes. And lastly, uh, this is uh, an absurd poem by E. E. Cummings um, called "Me Up at Does." Uh, here, this is the poem. Me up at does, out of the floor, quietly stare. A poisoned mouse, still who alive, is asking, what have I done that you wouldn't have? And so let's hear uh, how this poem can be interpreted by uh, this algorithm. All right, that's all I've got. Thank you very much for listening to my talk and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Dave. Uh, such an amazing and interesting session today. Uh, we have some time. So if anybody has any questions, uh, Dave is available for the next um, seven to eight minutes to answer. There are some amazing comments on the chat as well, uh, Dave, for of the session so oh yeah i'm looking at those yeah. now people are actually saying like uh, i think naresh is saying once more once more <laughs> <laughs> isn't for an encore uh, yes absolutely am i taking dj requests if yes aditya wants to hear appease demo gods yeah okay i could do that let me share my screen again <laughs> All right, so we'll change this to appease. Oh, actually, we could do three different words. We could do um, appease, demo, gods. Oh, I like that one.
Any other questions? The There's whole poem up thread. Oh, oh, right, right. OK. Yeah, let's do it. This is going to be very interesting because I don't know how well my algorithm handles uh, characters like the Lambda character there. But let's give it a try. It'll either, want, it'll either work or it won't. So let's see what happens. All right, let's maybe define this as a var, p's, demo gods. OK. Uh, so I think this will be very long, so I might need to cut it short, but we'll just uh, hear what it sounds like. It's very mysterious. Well, in the interest of time, I think I'll cut that off, but yeah. It's always interesting to hear what the different um, the like how how uh, what kind of musical ideas emerge from listening to just random uh, or you know programmatic output of uh, transforming a string into a, a you know music. All right, so Rakesh asks, are you using a lib to generate the the MIDI instructions, or have you written the MIDI bindings yourself? Ah, yes. So the uh, the MIDI is actually happening in a background process uh, called Alda Player. And it's um, these are spawned by Alda. It's kind of all under the hood. Um, but the Alda Player process is a JVM process. Uh, I actually wrote it in Kotlin. And uh, it's using the, the Java. The Java actually has a very good MIDI library built into it. There's the javax.sound.midi package. And so I'm using a MIDI synthesizer and MIDI uh, sequencer. So uh, thank you, Dave. And uh, Dave, do you also want to share uh, where people can reach out to you? That would be very helpful oh, yeah. for the audience. I'm glad you mentioned that. I actually had another slide that I totally forgot to show at the end. Uh, so yeah, let's chat. Um, uh, I actually, uh, there's, a, there's a Slack group for Alda, uh, which is um, not very active at the moment. I'd love to see more activity there. So if anybody is interested in Alda, um, please feel free to join for free and you can share your scores that you come up with, uh, share your music with, with the, the community. Um, you can, you can at mention me there for, if you have any questions about Alda or anything. Um, you can also feel free to reach out to me personally, email and Twitter are both good ways to do that. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Dave. It was, I think, wonderful uh, start for the weekend and great uh, presentation. Thank you.